Hi folks, good to be with you. folks God bless you um, my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com and uh, I want to report on a debate I had it's good to be with you I'm really really tired Sorry about that. that's the debate I had uh, So my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com Forgive me, I'm just really tired. It's just been a busy few weeks. So you can get me on uh, Twitter, you can get me on Facebook, and um, So, I put here uh, Aquil Onku versus Jason Burns, 19th of December 2, uh, um, 20th of the 17th. And I debated this Muslim Apologies um, t tonight, uh, right about 8 o'clock UK time. And... Uh, so I'm going to call um, my esteemed colleague, uh, Mr. Onku. So I debated this gentleman on a Muslim apologetic podcast. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on the debate, what I thought of it, and uh, various issues there. And so, so there we are. Uh, first of all... Uh, The gentleman I debated, uh, Onku, was impeccable. Uh, he is a very uh, sincere debater, very, very uh, nice man, and a uh, very passionate man. And uh, I really respect the guy, I really admire the guy, I really respect the guy. He conducted himself um, impeccably, you know. And uh, so, fair play to you, Mr. Onku. Um, my respect to you, bro. Uh, he had a character that was, to me, obviously a very nice man. Very, very nice man. A very nice man indeed. Alright. Uh, the horse, Yaya Snow, was very nice. And uh, also uh, others who, who were on there. Very amiable. Uh, the format of the debate was too short. Um, I think it could have been a lot longer in terms of a more structured debate. 20 minutes, 10, 10, 5. And I think it was suggested to have a, a, a dialogue where a minute question, a minute answer uh, and do it that way. And uh, I think that would have been a lot better. But I think they were just trying me out, seeing how I would go. Uh, there was a, an issue of questions. Uh, question time was not arranged. It was not part of the format. I agreed to it reluctantly. I didn't particularly... I don't like it because um, in the internet days with the atheists, they always use that as an opportunity to get their point of view in. It's hard to get your point of view in. And uh, some of the questions that were in this debate were more, more like other people wanting to debate me as well. Um, but I don't mind uh, because I'll deal with their issues now. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think uh, the, the, the question time was a bit unfair. 
I think the Muslims acknowledged that and they did agree to not record that bit and not put it up online. Uh, but I said, no, it's okay, you can put it up online. Uh, so, you know, they were fair in that way. But uh, they should have been a bit, behaved a bit more where they shouldn't have asked questions so long. Um, it was good. Uh, there was a, a, a very experienced debater there, gave us a bit of advice, and I appreciate that. Some of the advice was helpful. Uh, the one bit that I do think I do stand to my guns on because the question was uh, the sources of the resurrection and I emphasise quite a lot about presuppositions and so that meant we had to get into the Quranic presuppositions and uh, I thought that I felt that was a legitimate part of the discussion because the Quran is a, a document talking that Jesus didn't die and rise again Whereas the Muslim panel, um, not the debater, the debater was okay about it, the Muslim panel didn't think that was fair, It was we should have stuck to the topic of the sources of the resurrection, i.e. the New Testament. Well, I kind of disagree with them there, I think that we have presuppositions and the Quran is a presupposition that says Jesus didn't, didn't die and rise again. So the Quran is, to my mind, is an open book for critical assessment on the sources of the resurrection death and resurrection of Christ. Um, so in the debate, in the debate I used a paper of mine that I wrote uh, and I, I looked at presuppositions, I looked at uh, historical material for the Gospels, early source material, um, one of the panel later on in the question tried to debunk the uh, the issues concerning uh, the historical detail of the Gospels, and uh, just put that there. Uh, so I'll read a few quotes. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, sorry. F.F. F. Bruce says it is about uh, the Gospel of Luke and Luke's writing. It is not every scholar who would endorse Ramsey's judgment on Luke's technical expertise as a historian, but his detailed accuracy is something which can be checked time and time again. Research in the field which forms the historical and geographical background to Luke's narrative has not stood still since Ramsey heyday. But our respect for Luke's reliability continues to grow as our knowledge of this field increases Whatever may be said of Ramsey, no one will be inclined to charge the veteran American scholar Dr. Henry C. Cadbury with being an apologist. When Dr. Cadbury, after a long and distinguished career in which he made contributions of the highest quality to the study of Luke and Acts, delivered the Lowell Lectures for 1953 on the Book of Acts in history, he produced a fascinating work which can but enhance the reader's admiration for Luke's achievement. Dr. Cadbury's volume may indeed be hailed as a worthy sequel to Ramsey at his best. The historical trustworthy of Luke has indeed been acknowledged by many biblical critics whose standpoint has been definitely liberal, and in its conclusion of high importance for those who consider the New Testament from the angle of the historian, for the writing of Luke cover the period of our Lord's life and death and the thirty years of the Christian Church, including the years in which Paul's greatest missionary work was accomplished, and the majority of the extent letters were written. Uh, the two parts of Luke's history really bind the New Testament together. His gospel dealings uh, with the same events as other gospels. His acts providing the historical background to the epistles to the poor. So that's the New Testament documents by F.F. F. Bruce. And that tells you that the gospel of Luke and Acts is, is historically accurate. It's a source material for... for... Um, For, for the Gospels, uh, sorry, for the resurrection of Christ. So, other information about the Gospels. Uh, oh, so, let's go to the, uh, so there was a, someone on the panel who attacked the Gospel of John. 
has not been historical and come up with various information. And uh, he was he, he said in the on the panel that uh, Marcus Borg was behind some of the comments that he was making. And uh, when he said that, uh, he said that later on. Uh, I don't know if it's on the video. Uh, but the criticisms of the Gospel of John from Marcus Borg, I mean, he's like really, 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 really critical. And, it, and a lot of what Borg does is, is based on con conjecture. So a lot of his scholarship is conjectural. So the attacks that this Muslim made against the New Testament, specifically Gospel of John, by Mar using Marcus Borg, you know, a lot of a lot of Borg is conjectural, really. So, but anyhow, uh, Craig Blomberg, Blomberg, the historical reliability of the Gospel of John, fifty-nine confirmed or historical probable facts of the Gospel of John. Uh, Archaeology confirms the use of the stone water jars in New Testament times, John two six, given the early Christian tendency towards asceticism. The wine miracle is an unlikely invention uh, in two John two eight. Archaeology confirms the proper place of Jacob's well. 4.6. Josephus Ward of the Jews 2.236 confirmed there was significant hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans during Jesus' time. 4.9. Come down accurately describes the topography of Western Galilee. This is a significant elevation drop from Canaan to Capernaum. 4.49, 4.951. Went up accurately describes the accent to Jerusalem. 5.1. You could go on and on and on, and it's 50 odd facts concer concerning the Gospel of John. Then, um, if you look at the life of Muhammad in the Quran, uh, Surah 9, 128, Surah 21, 108, Chapter 33, 22, Chapter 33, 44, Chapter 33, 46, Chapter 34, 47, 33, 57, 48, 29, 68, or 5. There's no real historical data there, and the a Muslim apologist, the Muslim panel, agreed that the Quran is not really a historical book, but it's the Word of God. Well, that's a serious problem because how can we trust the Quran when it's talking about history when they just see it as the Word of God and not historical? So there's a problem there. And the same criteria that they use to criticize the New Testament, they don't use to criticize the Quran. And we wouldn't believe anything about Muhammad from the Quran if we used the critical skills that we use against the Bible. So, then we have uh, 84 confirmed facts in the last chapter of six, last 16 chapters of the book of Acts. Scholar, historian Colin Hermer has identified 84 facts in, the, in at least 16 chapters of the, in the last 16 chapters of the book of Acts. So, the natural crossing between Correctly named ports, Acts 13, 4, 5, the proper port Perga along the direct destination of a ship crossing from Cyprus, 13, 13, the proper location of Lyconia, 14, 6, the unusual but correct declination of the name Listeria, 14, 6, chapter 14, 6, the correct language spoken in Listeria, Lyconia, 14, 11. Now the thing that's interesting here, scholar and historian Colin Hermann is not a Christian believer, yet he's saying there's many historical facts in the, gospel, in the book of Acts. So what we're seeing is the New Testament is a very historical, reliable book, yet the same thing cannot be said with the Quran. In fact, when we look at the Quran, uh, and these guys didn't want me to to go into this, uh, but uh, hopefully we will. Go ahead. Yeah, here we are. So the issues of the Quran we have in the Quran. We have um, we have 
uh, Jesus' birth, palm tree, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Surah 19, 26 comes from the lost book of the Bible. Apocryphal fable, baby Jesus talking, Surah 19, 33, the first gospel infancy of Jesus Christ, and the creating birds from clay, Surah 349, Thomas Gospel of Infancy of Jesus. So what we're seeing here is um, that the Gospels, that the Quran is rooted in uh, fables really when it comes to any commentating about Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, that's an important issue that the Muslims have to look at. Also, uh, they talked about uh, in in the rejoiner. In the rejoiner, <laughs> are you okay? Got a cup of tea? I know I'm nearly finished. Someone's making a cup of tea. Um, in the rejoiner, they said about the chain of narration uh, that that protected the Quran. But we looked at Sara Bukhari, Volume Six, Sixty One. 556 shows that Muhammad forgot verses, so there was no such thing really as chain of narration. So the Islamic sources fail uh, to be helpful, adequate sources. Whereas we've seen in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts that it's a good source material uh, to, for doing history concerning the resurrection. Now, I just want to bring to you some other points. There was no dealing with the Gnostic Gospels. If you notice in the debate, there was no mentioning of that, no dealing with that scholarship. The Gnostic Gospels refer to the four Gospels, making the four Gospels early source material. Um, also, uh, on the issue of uh, Paul and Jesus' teaching as if, it, as if they're separate. Um, as if they're separate. We have we have uh, sorry for the background noise. <laughs> we have uh, Paul's core message was that Christ died for humanity's sin, was buried, was raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4. This coerced with Jesus' affirmation that he would die as a ransom for others. Mark 10, 45. Matthew 20, 28. And right from the dead. Matthew 20, 19. Luke 9, 22. Paul, who shows knowledge of some Jesus-specific teaching. Romans 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. 11, 23, 26. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. So, Paul's teaching uh, on the death and resurrection was the teaching that Jesus taught about himself. And that's in the book, uh, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, uh, by Michael J. Kruger. Michael J. Kruger, uh, The Heresy of Orthodoxy, is a good book uh, to look at. Then, on top of that, then, on top of that, uh, Nothing was said about the New Testament document. Nothing was said about uh, the New Testament documents, do documents concerning uh, the New Testament and the canon, and that the canon was already early established. And we see this in uh, the book and parchments, F.F. F. Bruce, origin about A.D. 230, enumerating the list of New Testament books, the four Gospels, Acts, Paul, Paul's 13 letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, and Revelation, as those which are acknowledged by all Christians. He has the Hebrews 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, James and Jude, the Epistle of Barnabas, and the Shepherd of Hermes, the Didache, and the Gospel according to the Hebrews were disputed by some. This means that simply that all the churches by this time were in agreement about the canonical, canonical quality of most of the New Testament. This is the book and parchments by F.F. F. Bruce. What that shows you is that right early on there was a clear understanding of, of what the New Testament was about. The main books that, that Origen was referring to refer to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And right early on most of the New Testament was accepted. There was only a few books 
that weren't, and there was disputes because of various reasons, such as, for example, um, the book of Revelation uh, was accepted early on, but later there was disputes about end times, and so there was heretics were using the book of Revelation so for the doctrine of end times, so people were beginning to question, uh, is the book of Revelation in the Bible? But generally speaking, over time, the New Testament won through, not because of, like Uthman, uh, standardizing a text and burning the evidence. No, it worked through and it was accepted because God uh, made it accepted. Uh, it worked by power uh, of the Holy Spirit. Then we have then we have uh, where I didn't go into uh, linguistic studies. Uh, a New Light of the Gospels, Clifford A. Wilson. Uh, here talks about many, many ancient manuscripts found. Um, so we have manuscripts, uh, papyri. Um, I'll just read this. The criticism has been answered to some degree, especially following the archaeology research of Professor. James Ramsey in the early years of this century. Subvervian kings such as Herod did submit to Augustus and other emperors and enrollments to places suggested, suggested by Luke. We even know from Egyptian records that the enrollments took place at 14 year intervals instituted by Caesar Augustus and continuing for over 200 years. We quote from Dr. A. S. Hunt, it is to the papyri that we owe our knowledge of the periodic consensus. The object of the census was taxation the cycle of 14 years depended on the fact that 14 was fixed at the age at which the poll tax became payable on the whole subjects of taxation, the papyri are very full of information. Dr. Grenfell and Hunt have this further comment. The conclusion to which the data from both sides converge is that the four years census cycle was instituted by Augustus. Moreover, the papyri are quite consistent with St. Luke's statement that this was the first enrollment Augustus certainly instituted the so-called provincial consensus of valuation property throughout the provinces, and there is nothing in the Egyptian papyri inconsistent with the belief that when Augustus instituted the 14 years census cycle, he also at the same time ordered a valuation of property, which was the first a series. So in other words, we found ancient Greek papyri uh, that confirms many of the historical uh, and linguistic language of the New Testament and also the historical information of the New Testament. Uh, and much of that can be found in this book, uh, New Light on the Gospels by Clifford A. Wilson. In the debate, nothing was said concerning Josephus and the scholarship on Josephus. Nothing was said on the scholarship of Tacitus in the debate, one cannot even enter the debate and get into the scholarship unless one is willing to deal with these sources and uh, my opponent and the panel were not able really to deal with any Josephus scholarship or Tatus scholarship uh, in that debate which was quite significant and quite important and quite revealing in, in, in the fact that they had not done any real significant research themselves on this topic. Um, I think that's about it really. Uh, I mentioned this book, Bart Ehrman has written a book responding to this, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses uh, by Richard Balcom and uh, he has done a main work criticising this and the book fails. A lot of scholars have said that Bart Ehrman's book is not up to his standard of uh, scholarship, that uh, he's not engaged with uh, the, the wide field of scholarship on the issue of white eyewitnesses and uh, so this book still has a lot going for it and still uh, the Muslim world and the academic world need to really engage with this book in a, in a much more scholarly way and, and basically in this book it gives you a lot of material to show you that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material. Now my friend used uh, some arguments on theology uh, said that the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament misquotes the Old Testament, and I would suggest, uh, 
I would suggest Roger Nichols, uh, the New Testament use of the Old Testament, Roger Nichol, use of the Old Testament, New Testament use of the Old Testament. And sometimes when the Gospels are quoting Old Testament, there's a variety of ways they do that and why they do that. And some of the issues are to do with the, uh, the Maserati text and the Septuagint text and the Gospel writers and New Testament sometimes choose one against the other and they have the reasons for doing that. Muslim scholars will say, well, the, the New Testament writers are just expounding and making their own interpretation, but there's reasons for it and you need to go into detail. So uh, Roger Nichols' essay on uh, the New Testament use of the Old Testament is a very helpful article uh, to do, to read and to look at that. Also, look at all the prophecies, the messianic prophecies. There are over 300. Uh, just Google that and you'll see how the, Old, the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Uh, much better than the Muslim apologists who say that Muhammad fills the, new, the, the prophecies in the, in the Bible. And we can't find any of those prophecies. We can't find Muhammad. They might quote Isaiah 42, but Isaiah 42 it talks about uh, the servant, the elect. Uh, there are many allusions to the Messiah in Isaiah 42, so it cannot be related to Muhammad. So in other words, when my opponent, esteemed opponent, opponent is using, uh, saying that the Old Testament has been misquoted by the New, I would say read Roger Nicol, and that is an article that you can look at. On the issue of the atonement, and the doctrine of the atonement, and saying it's not biblical, I would ask my esteemed opponent and the panel to get hold of this copy of Systematic Theology by Rob, Dr. Robert L. Raymond and study that on the Doctrine of the Atonement, uh, which will be a very helpful book for you to get hold of and to study. Uh, it's uh, Dr. L. Raymond, uh, New Testament Theology of the Christian Faith. Um, In my debate with the, the gentleman, my strategy, uh, just a couple of things, I did in the debate deal with, uh, I dealt with uh, contradictions in the Gospels by referring to alleged contradictions in the Gospels by Dr. Timothy McGrew, Dr. Timothy McGrew is a couple of articles there and also a book by uh, Vern Poitras, Inerrancy in the Gospels. You can get it on John Frame's website, Inerrancy in the Gospels by uh, Vern Poitras. And I dealt with uh, so-called contradictions of the New Testament, uh, the, the Gospel narratives, uh, referring people to those article and book, and also Jesus and the Resurrection uh, on Christian Think Tank it is an excellent article on this issue. Uh, my overall strategy really was to show that we have presuppositions when we look at evidence and to show that I've tried to get more of an objective way of looking at it, but we're all biased, even the atheist is biased, but try to show that there is some way, can we try to find some way of being honest about our presuppositions. Secondly, I tried to show that there's good historical grounds to trust in the Gospels. And then thirdly, uh, rooted it all in, in basic kind of current scholarship, such as N.T. Wright's book uh, and uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, etc. by Richard Balcom, really. So that's, that was basically my strategy. And also to root it in... Uh, solid source material such as Josephus, Titus and the Gnostic Gospels. So that was my strategy and uh, I, I think that's that was my main kind of aim really uh, of coming at this topic. Uh, yeah so I think a couple of other books to read uh, popular apologetics book is Josh McDowell and Bill Wilson, He Walked Among Us, Evidence for the Historical Jesus. This goes into Tacitus, it goes into the 
Mishnah, the Talmud, it goes into a lot of stuff there, very, very helpful. Uh, published by uh, I, I don't know who it's published by. So there's some lot. Of, there's a lot of good, helpful material in here. It's very popular, but very, very good. Well, it's got Alpha here, published by Alpha, but. Uh, it's called uh, Josh McDowell and Bill Wilson. He walks among us, evidence for the historical Jesus. Very, very helpful book. Popular book that you can get hold of. And this book, Jesus and Christian Origins Outside the New Testament. So in my debate, and not only, and also this book, The New Testament Documents by F.F. F. Bruce, and also Jesus and uh, Christian Origins, uh, Outside the New Testament by F.F. F. Bruce, published by Hodder and Sorton. I think you'll get this second hand, uh, you get this first hand, published by IVP. The New Testament documents are they reliable. And also get hold of this book, uh, Messiah, Jesus, the Evidence of History, IVP, uh, Dr. Paul Barnett. Dr. Paul Barnett, have a look at that, that will be helpful for you. So. And then have a look at uh, N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God. The Resurrection of the Son of God. I think you can get that free PDF, uh, a 700 page volume. Okay, sorry I got itchy, itchy feet. So, I'll just recap. Also you can look at this. This is uh, the case for Mary, uh, the, the uh, sorry, it, it's uh, confidentchristian.com, confidentchristian.com by Mary Jo, Mary Jo, and uh, she goes into the resurrection here, and uh, we'll just conclude with what she has to say, and then we finish. Then I'm done. <clears throat> Jewish Talmud, Sahindran 4.3a. On the eve of Passover, Yeshua was hanged. Since nothing was brought forward in his favour, he was hanged. On the eve of Passover, Jewish Talmud, Sahindran 43. Uh, Lucian of Samosa, second century critic, the Christians you know, Worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced the novel rites and was crucified on that account. These misguided creatures deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live, live after his laws. One of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of the Roman prefect Judea Pontius Pilate, agnostic skeptic Bar Ehrman. That he, Jesus, was crucified is sure as anything historical ever can be. John Dominic Cross, a liberal theologian, leader of Jesus' seminar. So we're going to look at the empty tomb viewed by Mary Madeleine, Mary, mother of James, Peter, John, Jewish leaders, devised lie, cover up the resurrection. Jewish leaders never refuted claim that body was gone. Sorry. Empty tomb viewed by Mary and Madeleine, Mary, mother of James, Peter and John. Two. Jewish leaders devised lies to cover up the resurrection. Three, Jewish leaders never refuted claims that the body was gone. And four, non-Christian historians record the Christians' claims of Jesus being alive and the body being gone. Jesus was publicly executed in Jerusalem and his appearance took place there. His resurrection was proclaimed there. If the body had still been in the tomb, it would have been very easy to stop Christianity's message in its origin by simply going to well-known tomb and producing the body, but that's not what happened. Josephus Antiquities, but let not the testing of woman be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. 
Josephus Antiquities 4, 8, 15, if, uh, women were not, if women were seen as not important in the Jewish times, as Josephus says, why is it that women were used to tell of Jesus' resurrection? Tom and Rose, Hashina 1, 8, any evidence which the woman gives is not valid, also they are not valid to offer. If the disciples or gospel writers were going to make up a lie that would stick in the first century, they certainly would not have invented the story of woman being the first witness of the, to the resurrection of Jesus. What was interesting, my opponent never presented any, any uh, counter hypotheses. And that's always a, a good way of seeing whether, you're, whether the person's view is really standing up to scrutiny. My view of the resurrection answers all the historical data, shows us why certain things happen, we have evidence for that. Whereas the Muslim counter, there's no evidence, there's no hypotheses, there's nothing to ground, there's no historical data, and then there's nothing to ground it in a reason or a plausible motive of what actually happened. Oxford University Church historian William One, all the strictly historical evidence we have is in favour of the empty tomb, and those scholars who reject it ought to recognise that they do so on some other ground than that of scientific history. It is historically certain that Peter and the other disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, Gerd Ludemann, atheist, Gutten University, Germany. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 5, I didn't go into this a lot, uh, I only mentioned it in part uh, in, in the uh, Q&A. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 5, AD 55. That is a creed. One of the earliest creeds circulated in the first century historians believe Paul learned it from five years of Jesus' death. This is the sort of data that historians of antiquity drew over Dr. John Rogers' Trinity Episcopal School for Ministry. In AD 69-155, Irenaeus, but Polycarp, disciple of John, also was not only instructed by apostles and con conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia, having always taught the thing which he had learned from the apostles. The Apollocarp was martyred in Smyrna around the year 160 at the age of 86. In his letter to the Church of Philippi, he mentions the resurrection of Jesus five times, one of which is, For they did not love the present age, but him who died for our benefit and for our sake was raised by God. Letter to Philippians 9.2 You see that the disciples have transformed lives. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Matthew 26, 5, 6. Then Acts 4, 1, 14. As they were speaking to the people, the priests of the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day. For it was already evening. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Cyphus, Cephas, and John the Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been well made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health, he is the, the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is a salvation, no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among you, men, by which we must be saved. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply, Acts 4, 1, 14. Clement, Bishop of Rome. So why is it that the disciples are scared and the next minute they see a resurrection and the preaching boldly rose from the dead? How can they be scared and then preach? Does it make sense unless they actually saw it? 
Clement, a bishop of Rome, A.D. 3100, therefore having received orders and complete certainty caused by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and believing the word of God, they, the disciples, went with the Holy Spirit, certainly preaching the good news that the kingdom of God is about to come. Clement, bishop of Rome, A.D. 3100. But Ehrman, why then did some of the disciples claim to see Jesus alive after his crucifixion? I don't doubt at all that some of the disciples claimed this. We don't have any of the written testimony, but Paul, writing about 25 years later, indicates that this is what they claimed, and I don't think he is making it up. And he knew at least a couple of them whom he met just three years after the event. So he doesn't agree, Bart Ehrman, uh, with the Gospels in terms of their historical veracity. But he's contradicting himself because he's now saying that they had historical veracity, veracity because Paul confirms the death and resurrection that they were actually saying the truth. So there's a contradiction in Bart Ehrman there, if anyone can see it. So we have evidence for the disciples transformed lives. Peter was crucified upside down, Andrew crucified on an X-shaped cross, James disciple beheaded by Herod, John disciple banished to Patmos, died natural death in Ephesus. Thomas martyred in India, James, half brother of Jesus, thrown from the top of a temple, then stoned. Bartholomew filleted, filleted alive. Matthew killed with a sword in Ethiopia. Luke hanged in Greece. Matthew stoned and beheaded. Jude murdered by archers. Barnabas stoned at Salonica, and Paul beheaded in Rome. Ro writings of origin tell of Peter being crucified upside down and Paul's martyrdom in Rome by Nero. Why would these people suffer? if they were deluded or telling a lie. I believe that they truly saw Jesus Christ and that's why they died. Bart Ehrman and all these textual critics who attack the Bible, are they willing to die for their faith? These people, Paul and Peter and the others, they were willing to die for their faith. Ignatius, Bishop in Antioch, martyrdom in Rome, AD 110. When Jesus came to those with Peter, he said to them, take hand, hand on me and see that I am not a bot, but Bodiless, bodiless demon, and immediately they handled him and believed, having known his flesh and blood. Because of this, they also despised death, but beyond death they were found. Ben Witherington III, Jesus, the Jesus seer, in his book, The disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 were not heading for a spiritual retreat experience. They were leaving town with their tails between their legs, mumbling we had the hope that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Their actions spoke as loudly as their words. They had abandoned such hope until fate, in the form of appearance of a stranger, intervened. Why would it be that the Gospels put incriminating evidence in them? Why would you put that in there about the Emmaus Road and the disciples not seeing Jesus, but walking with Jesus? You won't put that in if you was lying. It's incriminating evidence. So it shows they're being honest. Uh, John 7, 5, transformed lives for James, the Lord's brother, was transformed by the resurrection. For not even his brothers were believing in him, John 7, 5. Not in the first century, it was embarrassing for a rabbi to have his family not, not be followers. Then he appeared to James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Festus was now dead and Albius was but upon the road, so he assembled the Sahendrian of the judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James and some others, and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Josephus Antiquities 29.1 Transformation of Paul, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him, but Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Acts 8, 1, 3. Then Acts chapter 26, 22, 23. So having obtained help from God, I, Paul, stand to this day, testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So what made Paul change? Why did he change? Because he saw Jesus. 
But Herman, there is no doubt that Paul believed he saw Jesus' real but glorified body raised from the dead. Bart Ehrman, skeptic. So we have multiple independent sources attested by enemies of Christianity, supporters of the facts, embarrassing admissions support the facts, eyewitness testimony support the facts, early testimony supports the facts. From all friend and foe alike, all validate the facts of the resurrection. They are not in dispute. Dr. Paula Fredrickson, Boston University, says, I know in their own terms that what they, the disciples, saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attested their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know that they saw. But I do know that as a historian that they must have seen something. Dr. Paul Fredrickson, Boston University. So let's look at some ideas that might contest this. Psychological, the disciples and others imagined the risen Christ changed from unbelieving cowards into courageous evangelists and went to their death from something they were wrong about or ultimately knew to be true. That just doesn't sound viable, does it? Biological, Jesus survived the beating, scourging cross, and appeared thrust into his heart, filled his executioners, recuperated, recuperated in the tomb, rolled away the stone, and had his resurrection falsely proclaimed. Do we really believe that? It seems to me that the Romans knew how to kill people and if, if he wasn't killed, the Roman soldiers would have been killed. So it was either kill him or be killed. So they're not going to just make a mistake on the death of Jesus. Theological Christ's resurrection was a true historically valid and divine miracle where Jesus died and came back to life three days later, which is in keeping with the theme of miracles in the Gospels. That's a better explanation. All the Gospels written before AD 90, likely much earlier, Paul's 1 Corinthians written 15 years after the resurrection. Early writing is important because eyewitnesses can refute error. Paul requested just such a thing, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, 8, where he referenced 500 witness to Christ's resurrection. No case in history of myth entering into a historical account where two generations have not passed. Sir Frederick J. Kenyon, the internal then... The interval then between the dates of the original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to as substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. Sir Frederick J. Kenyon, former director of Principal Librarian, British Museum, the Bible and Archaeology. And we see in Mark... 6, 9, 11, John 21, 1, 18, Matthew 28, 9, 10, Luke 24, 32, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Luke 24, 13, 35, Mark 16, 12, Mark 16, 14, Luke 24, 26, 42, John 20, 19, 25, John 20, 26, 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, John 21, 1, 25, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Matthew 28, 1, 16, 20, Mark 16, 15, 18, and Acts 1, 3, 12. All in those verses uh, is eyewitness material of Jesus. So, that's it. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm done. So, Heresy of Orthodoxy by Michael J. Kruger on the canon, Paul Barnett, Messiah, Jesus, the Evidence of History, IVP, F.A. Bruce, the New Testament Documents, IVP, Jesus, Christian Origins Outside the New Testament, F.F. Bruce, uh, Joshua Dow and Bill Wilson, He Walks Among Us, Evidence for the Historical Jesus, get that, the Books and Parchments, F.F. Bruce, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, Richard Balcom, 
and uh, a new system a, a new systematic theology of the Christian faith, Dr. Robert L. Raymond, uh, published by Nelson, and uh, New Light on the Gospels by Clifford A. Wilson, and uh, N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God. Roger Nichols' article on the Old Testament, the use of the New Testament, uh, the New Testament use of the Old Testament. And uh, look at also a uh, Christian think tank and uh, the issue of contradictions in the New Test in the resurrection accounts, a uh, Christian think tank, uh, and also Poitras' book, Inerrancy and the Gospels. Uh, on John Frame's website if you've got issues about other contradictions in the gospel. So that's it really. Um, and the Quran is, is not a book to to be using as history. We read Surah 22 47, the length of the day, surely a day Surah uh, 70 verse 4, All surely a day with you, Lord, is a thousand years of your counting. Sorry, Surah 22, 47. Surah 22, 47. As surely a day with you, Lord, is a thousand years of your counting. Uh, Surah 70 verse 4 says to him, The angels, the spirit mount up in a day, when the measure is fifty thousand years. It says, Ibn Abbas considered the premier Islamic interpreter was incapable of reconciling these passages. Abu Umbad said, a certain man asked Ibn Abbas about a day whose measure was 50,000 years, to which he answered, they were two days which Allah has mentioned in his book. Allah alone knows what they are, I do not know what they are, and I am afraid to say about them that which is not according to my knowledge. So, in other words, there's contradictions after contradictions after contradictions after contradictions within the Quran. You can get to this uh, by Sam Shimon. Um, look at the contradictions of the Quran by Sam Shimon. Look, the textual criticism of the Quran. Look at Keith Small's book, uh, The Textual Criticism of the Quran. Uh, will give you information about what the Quran is really about. That the the document as 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 is not what it's made out to be. That's it, really. Um, my esteemed friend never dealt with the Surah thirty three thirty seven, where Muhammad uh, changed uh, the adoption law to suit himself, so he could marry his own uh, adopted son's wife. Uh, so the Quran's not a book to be looking at um, in terms of history, it's just, it's just not a book from God. Okay, that's it guys. I'm tired. So we're done. Excuse me. So, on the issue of literacy, how could the people who were not literate write things like the Gospel of John? Well, I was just saying that linguistically, um, the Gospel of John is like rooted in the reality of the time. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's not like a book that's not written for its time. You know, it's not it's not written someone at a late date in the second century, it's definitely someone in the first century who knew and understood Jesus' teaching. So, you know, it's it's likely it's John just based on that linguistic study of the time, the way the language was used in the context of the Jewish culture of that time. And uh, secondly, there are key li there were key libraries dotted around the ancient world where people could go and get an education. Uh, thirdly, um, literary, l literary uh, skills in the ancient world were much bigger than scholars are willing to give credence to. We found so many uh, letters in Egypt, 
and ancient letters that have shown us that there was much more literary culture than we 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 really as, as modern people and scholars are really willing to grant. So it's not impossible for um, them to learn stuff and to grow and to to learn to write in a in a much more uh, deeper way uh, and profound way. Um, Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a bit about, about uh, uh, on the literary thing, you know, Muhammad was not educated, suppose, and he, he supposedly had these revelations. So why can't uh, the Apostle John have a revelation and write, you know, what's good enough for the goose is good enough for the gander. So, So I'll finish with this quote by Dr. Wolfgang Shadowalt. Dr. Wolfgang Shadowalt is in an article by G. Boyd, Jesus Seminar and the Reliability of the Gospels. Wolfgang Shadowalt says, one of the 20th century's most reputable classical philologist, indeed on many accounts, he was the greatest Homer scholar ever. If ever there was a man who knew how to judge the value of ancient documents, it was he. In a lecture addressed to the Theological Faculty of Hamburg and later to theologians at Ham Tübingen, he says this about the Gospels. As a philologist, someone who has acquired some knowledge of literature, I am particularly concerned here to note that when we read the Synoptic Gospels, we cannot be other than captivated by the experiential vividness with which we are confronted. I know of no other area of history, written biography or poetry, where I encounter so great a wealth of material in such a small place. That's his view concerning um, the sources behind the resurrection. So I'll pray. Thank you for listening and God bless you all. May God be with you all. Don't forget my website, chasingbirdspreacher.com. Uh, don't forget